All right, we are responding to a cardiac arrest call here. Um, we're actually going to assist another paramedic and EMT that's already on scene. So it is a confirmed cardiac arrest. Uh, you might notice it, there's no sirens going on in this call. Uh, we are responding with lights on, uh, and sirens, of course, will be enabled. But uh, as you can see, it's pretty late at night here. There's not a lot of traffic on the road. So rather than wake up the community that we're responding on these back roads here, uh, we're just responding kind of, kind of uh, you know, incognito, if you will. Um, some agencies require you to use your lights and sirens at all times, uh, and technically that is the rule, but when you're traveling late at night, you know, these back roads, we try to, uh, you know, limit the sirens uh, when we're responding. Um, the one thing with this call is, uh, again, it is a confirmed cardiac arrest, uh, but it's, it's uh, initially came in as a car accident, um, and it evolved where the patients had an altered mental status and then where they uh, became unresponsive and then into cardiac arrest. So it's kind of been evolving. So we're not really sure just yet if when we get there, if this, the arrest and the altered mental status and all that is secondary to a traumatic event, a traumatic type of, of arrest, or if it's uh, secondary to a medical complaint and the patient wound up, you know, having an accident secondary to, uh, secondary to alter mental status or maybe secondary to some type of cardiac event going on that caused that person to get into a car accident. So we're going to be there soon. I'm going to shut this down. Got to do some communication with the crew on scene, uh, find out what exactly they're going to need from us when we get there on arrival. And I'll let you know what we found and some more details on this call and what we did on the other side. Okay, so uh, we respond to this call, and like I mentioned um, in the beginning, uh, that we weren't quite sure if this cardiac arrest was secondary to a traumatic event or some type of a medical event. Um, so the uh, the crew on scene was already on scene before we got there doing ALS and doing CPR and all. But we had to you know they had to decide whether or not this was a traumatic event or non-traumatic cardiac arrest. Um, it appeared that uh, the first responders, the police and firefighters on scene prior to the paramedic uh, said the patient was out of the vehicle already. Uh, he was actually diaphoretic and had an old mental status and seemed to be having some shortness of breath and wound up collapsing uh, outside the vehicle and going to cardiac arrest. There was actual minimal damage uh, to the vehicle. It's, it kind of just bumped into a stationary uh, object and the patient didn't have any obvious uh, traumatic injuries. So it appears that this was secondary to a medical event that caused the patient to lose control and uh, you know go into a stationary object and then in turn he, that medical event evolved into a full cardiac arrest. So uh, when we got there, the paramedic on scene was already doing CPR. He was getting uh, the intubation going. Uh, the patient was in a systole, uh, you know, and he didn't have any shocks indicated. There was no shocks given to this patient, so he was in a systole when uh, the fire department actually put their defibrillator on him and when the paramedic did it too. So just followed, you know, the a a ACLS protocol pretty much um, with vasopressin and, uh, you know, following that protocol, uh, you know, follow, of course, your regional protocol, but we went ahead and gave the, the vasopressin. We actually have the option where I am to give you the, the epi or the vasopressin or combination depending upon uh, the time frame, the patient's in arrest and CPR and all that. Um, the one thing I want to mention is, you know, these days you see a lot of stuff out there as far as uh, paramedics intubating and, and questionable uh, things that go on, whether or not we should be intubating patients or not in the field. And uh, you know, one thing that you can use to confirm intubation is the end tidal uh, CO2 waveform uh, on, on a life pack or a Zoll or whatever type of monitor that you're using. The one thing I just want to point out, you know, when you've got a patient in a systole, you're probably not going to get a normal uh, uh, end title reading where you're going to get 35 to 45 uh, reading on the monitor. You're going to probably get more around uh, 5 or 10, maybe 12 uh, on on the monitor. So, and a lot of times they, you know, the studies have shown that if it's less than 5, it's not a very good outcome for the patient uh, to get a, a return of spontaneous circulation. So you pre pretty much you know don't have that much of a viable patient, but you never know, right? So you have to just look at that. Just keep that in mind when you're looking at your end title that you're not going to really see a big jump like that once you get them intubated 
uh, we're going to see it, you know, at 2025 or whatever. But if you do see something in 2025 and you have a patient, um, I would suggest to reevaluate the patient for pulses and and whatnot. Uh, if you're going from, let's say, a 5 or a 10 and then you're doing CPR for a little bit and it jumps to, let's say, 2025, 20, go ahead and check for a pulse and stop CPR for a moment and evaluate the rhythm and make sure the patient doesn't have pulses back. So what else does, does the end title look for? You know, keep in mind, one of the reasons why you have it so low is because it also reads the cardiac output. So, you know, a patient that has normal cardiac output um, going on, they're going to have that higher uh, end title reading. When they have a low cardiac output, such as a patient's in cardiac arrest, you're going to have the much lower uh, end title reading of, you know, again, you know, between like 5, 10, maybe 15 uh, on the monitor, you know. So just keep that in mind when you're looking at your end title and you're doing CPR and you're evaluating your your intubation and, uh, you know, your, your success as far as your compressions are going and maybe ret return of spontaneous uh, circulation. Well, that's it for this uh, virtual response medic. Um, you know, this call went pretty smoothly. Uh, the good part was we had a lot of help on scene between firefighters. We had two uh, paramedics, two EMTs on scene as well. Um, so it went pretty smoothly. Unfortunately, it wasn't a great outcome for the patient. You know, a lot of times they assist it's very difficult to get those patients back. But it was a great experience for the paramedic student on scene to see how all interagencies can operate like that. Um, you know, calling for backup and uh, seeing the whole evolution of a cardiac arrest patient. Also put a little spin on it for the medic student as well to kind of differentiate the traumatic versus non-traumatic and not to get that tunnel vision of just because it's a, a car accident that's going to order automatically be a traumatic arrest. So um, I hope you got something out of this virtual response medic. Um, this is Jim Hoffman from the EMS Professional, and as always, stay safe.